Well, hello everyone, and welcome once again to Vlogatos. I'm Phil Ramsey, and in this Bible True series, we go through the Word together, chapter and verse. And uh, the purpose of uh, Vlogatos is really, you know, just wherever wherever God wants to send it, I believe that He can cause the greatest effect to go wherever He desires. Um, our heart is just to serve and to make it all the way through the Bible, like we felt like the Lord instructed us to do. And so hopefully this is helpful to you. Um, so in 2 Corinthians, um, we've been going through it and, you know, Paul talked about how we have this treasure in earthen vessels, or as the NLT puts it, the, um, uh, you know, fragile clay jars like, um, this, um, you know, we still have this flesh and blood body after we accept Christ, but of course our, um, our uh, spirit, or as the, the word calls it, the inner man, you know, the inner man and the outer man, and the inner man is the spirit, what you are. And then the outer man being your body. And uh, then, there, of course, there's the soul, body, soul, and spirit. And so um, he, he's talking about uh, the natural body and how the natural body is going to eventually be affected by what we call the new birth. When you accept Christ and you're born again. Jesus talked about that in John chapter 3 where he told Nicodemus you need to be born again. And he was talking about being born of God's spirit and so then uh, you have a um, if you have said out loud that Jesus is your Lord you believe in your heart God's risen from the dead then you have uh, a, a likeness together with him your your spirit is now born of God's spirit and so has characteristic characteristics of God's spirit and we've talked about before Jesus talk, uh, told the disciples in the garden of Gethsemane when they were sleeping and and uh, he was telling them, can't you, Terry, just one hour, just spend an hour in prayer with me and watch. And uh, he said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And so the body that we still have is weak and it contains that sin nature, but uh, it will be recreated just like the spirit has been. Um, but the time yet, time has not yet come for that because now at this point, uh, we're still waiting for Jesus to return. And while we do that, we are occupying till he returns, as he told us to do, but we're also winning people uh, while there's still time for them to be saved. Don't know why I got off on all that, but let's go ahead and pray and we'll jump into the word. So, Father, I thank you for uh, your word. I thank you that uh, you do explain things to us, mysteries, things that, um, you know, the natural man uh, has no understanding of, can, can't understand it. But uh, these things are spiritually discerned. And uh, you explain these things to us through revelation uh, and your word. And I thank you for them and uh, help, ask that you help us to understand them uh, better and better. Uh, the, the, the words that you speak uh, in, th to us through this Bible. And I thank you for these things. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So here we are, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So, like I said, he's continuing this discussion about the body. So he says, For we know that when this earthly tent we live in is taken down, that is when we die and leave this earthly body, we will have a house in heaven. Now, he's not talking about the mansions that Jesus was talking about. What he's talking about is that the house in heaven is uh, your recreated body, the, the new body like, like uh, Jesus has. And so he's like, he compares this body now as like an earthly tent. And he's like, but... Uh, when we die, we, we go to be with the Lord, we'll have a, a, a house in heaven. And so he, by comparison, he's saying this is a greater than what you have now. It, it will be greater. So he says, uh, we'll have a house in heaven. This is still verse 1. An eternal body made for us by God himself and not by human hands. We grow weary in our present bodies. And we long to put on our heavenly bodies like new clothing. For we will put on heavenly bodies. We will not be spirits without bodies. While we live in these earthly bodies, we groan and sigh. But it's not that we want to die and get rid of these bodies that clothe us. Rather, we want to put on our new bodies so that these dying bodies will be swallowed up by life. God himself has prepared us for this. And as a guarantee, he has given us his Holy Spirit. So we are always confident, even though we know that as long as we live in these bodies, we are not at home with the Lord. For we live by believing and not by seeing. Yes, we are fully confident and we would rather be away from these earthly bodies. For then we will be at home with the Lord. So he's talking about this hope that we have, you know, the confident expectation that one day when we do die, 
uh, it's not and it's not the end it's uh, we will uh, live on but yet we will also have a heavenly body uh, that Jesus pre uh, prepares for us uh, for, for us to have and so he says how do we know that we have that well the guarantee is the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit resides on the inside of us when he came when the moment that we accepted Christ the moment we said out loud Jesus you're my Lord and believed in our heart that God rose him from the dead the Holy Spirit came and recreated our spirit so that it was now born of God's spirit and the Holy Spirit now resides on the inside of us and so he exists he lives with us as a guarantee that look if God recreated my spirit and and uh, and now the Holy Spirit bears witness with my spirit that I belong to Christ that means that I he is my guarantee that yes God will do the same thing with my physical body that he did with my spirit you see it's just not time for it yet we have an assignment here and so uh, let me see where was I I think that we are yep so verse 9 so whether we are here in this body or away from this body our goal is to please him for we must all stand before Christ to be judged we will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body now that refers to uh, the judgment seat of Christ which doesn't judge whether or not we will go to hell the judgment seat of Christ is the throne of grace where uh, it's like you're only standing there because you belong to him in the first place people who don't belong to Christ will end up standing at the great white throne of judgment uh, where the father uh, judges them and and uh, the book of Revelation talks about that but for those of us who have accepted Christ uh, we go to the throne of grace where Jesus is because he purchased us so that makes sense then that he is the one who renders judgment about our works whether what we have done for him um, deserves a reward or not since he, he bought us then he's the one who judges us and so Jesus is a kind judge so let's just live to please him so that our works will be acceptable to him so verse 11 but we understand our fearful responsibility to the Lord we work hard to persuade others God knows we are sincere and I hope you know this too are we commending ourselves to you again no, we are giving you a reason to be proud of us, so you can answer those who brag about having a spectacular ministry rather than having a sincere heart. See, that's really all that matters to God. You know, people can make their ministry look spectacular. They can make it look really impressive, but that's not what matters to God. What matters is their heart. Is it sincere? I mean, you could you could you have a spectacular ministry and a sincere heart? Yeah, you could. But uh, the heart is the important part. Verse 13. If it seems we are crazy, it is to bring glory to God. And if we are in our right minds, it is for your benefit. Either way, Christ's love controls us. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have all died to our old life. He died for everyone so that those who receive this new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them you know uh, temptation has a less power over somebody who's not living for themselves if they're not living to please themselves if they're not living to uh, you know to see to only their own needs or their own interests then the temptations in their life or I should say the influence of temptation is greatly diminished because if my will is submitted uh, to pleasing Jesus rather than pleasing myself or or living to further my own uh, my own causes or my own goals then the temptation around me won't have as great of a hold on my life because I'm focused not on those things or not on things um, of the natural mind I'm focused on on Jesus and so uh, this is you know where you see Jesus was so focused because he he's like my words are not my own he's like I don't even speak my own words my words come from my father he's like I don't I don't say anything unless I hear the father say it I don't do anything unless I see the father do it and he's talking about he had such a strong relationship with the father based on his uh, his intimacy with the word because this is how he overcame temptation with Satan right it is written it is written it is written and we talked about that how it was actually written on his heart um, the psalmist said uh, I have written your 
your words on my on the tablet of my heart so that I will not transgress against you. And so uh, when I let God's word rule my life, see then uh, a temptation is not going to have the same hold that it once had. And it's a progressive uh, leaning into, if you will, um, more and more on God's word and his will and living to please him. That's all tied together. So he said in verse 16, he says, so we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. How differently we know him now. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone and new life has begun. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. So, it, so it's, it's, the, the, the sins of the world have already been paid for. Jesus paid for all of humanity's sins. That does, mean, that does not mean that all of humanity will benefit from the payment that he has made. Because uh, a gift cannot be just thrust upon somebody. He says this is a gift from God. So um, you, can, uh, you can have a gift presented to you, yet you can refuse to receive that gift. And so he says it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a ministry of reconciliation because it's like, look, God has already paid the price through Christ to reconcile you to himself. Jesus has paid the price for all of your sins, and uh, God is now inviting you through Jesus to come into fellowship with him and become an adopted son, an adopted daughter. Yet not everyone will accept this offer. And so it is a ministry of reconciliation because look, God wants to reconcile with you. He wants you to return. And so verse 20, he says, so we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God for God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. And one of my Bible teachers, you know, he, he brought up an excellent point about being an ambassador. You know, he said, so if you, if you, if so an ambassador is someone who is appointed and we're talking in terms now of um, our American government, you know, if the, 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 the president appoints his ambassador. So he will choose, I want so-and-so to be my ambassador to, um, Sweden, you know, whatever country he chooses. Well, now, if he chooses you to uh, be an ambassador to Sweden, the reason he's choosing you is you probably have some sort of background, you probably have some sort of um, connection point with that country, but that's not really enough because even if you have some sort of generic background or something like that, uh, that doesn't mean that you are fully acquainted um, with that people. But even then, even if you're fully acquainted with that people, you may not be fully acquainted with the president's policies towards that nation. And so if you are appointed, if the president was to appoint you as an ambassador to Sweden, you are going to have to spend some time with the president, with his cabinet, and, and find out what, what, what does he want me to say? What does he, wh how does he want me to represent him to this country? And so if we are Christ's ambassadors to the world, that means that we should spend some time with the Lord, find out what his policy is to the people of, of this of this planet. You know, what 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 I mean, yeah, we, we have some understanding of them because we uh, we were born of this world. And so we've we've got some understanding and we, we know the temptations that other people face. We have a, a basic understanding of that thing. But what but what we need to do is is spend some time with the Lord and find out well, how does he want me to talk to them? It's not just about bringing his words to them, I also have to speak in such a way that he would speak because I am speaking on his behalf. And so I just thought that was a very good, uh, a very good point to bring up, you know, in talking about, about this, because Paul's spending a great deal of time talking about this ministry of reconciliation and how we are ambassadors. So chapter six, then he says, as God's partners, we beg you not to accept this marvelous gift of God's kindness and then ignore it. 
For God says, at just the right time I heard you. On the day of salvation I helped you. Indeed, the right time is now. Today is the day of salvation. And, uh, you know, the Old Testament says, seek the Lord while he may be found. It's the ex and it talked about it talks about the acceptable year of the Lord. This is the acceptable time. This is the age of grace. This is the time. So is there, there's a reason why at Jesus' birth, the angels proclaimed peace on earth, goodwill toward men. And we talked about that, too, how it wasn't peace on earth between the peoples of the earth. It wasn't about it. it I mean, wars didn't cease. It was peace on earth between God and man because Jesus had uh, arrived to be God's offering of peace to hum humankind um, because he wants to reconcile mankind to himself through Jesus as he just said at the end of chapter 5. So this is God's goal and this is the acceptable time to accomplish that goal. So verse 3 he said we live in such a way that no one will stumble because of us and no one will find fault with our ministry. In everything we do, we show that we are true ministers of God. We patiently endure troubles and hardships and calamities of every kind. We have been beaten, put in prison, faced angry mobs, worked to exhaustion, endured sleepless nights, and gone without food. We prove ourselves by our purity, our understanding, our patience, our kindness, by the Holy Spirit within us, and by our sincere love. We faithfully preach the truth. God's power is working in us. We use the weapons of righteousness in the right hand for attack and the left hand for defense. We serve God whether people honor us or despise us, whether they slander us or praise us. We are honest, but they call us impostors. We are ignored even though we are well known. We live close to death, but we are still alive. We have been beaten, but we have not been killed. Our hearts ache, but we always have joy. We are poor, but we give spiritual riches to others. We own nothing, yet we have everything. O oh, dear Corinthian friends, we have spoken honestly with you, and our hearts are open to you. There is no lack of love on our part, but you have withheld your love from us. I am asking you to respond as if you were my own children. Open your hearts to us. Don't team up with those who are unbelievers. How can righteousness be a partner with wickedness? How can light live with darkness? What harmony can there be between Christ and the devil? How can a believer be a partner with an unbeliever? And what union can there be between God's temple and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will live in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from among unbelievers and separate yourselves from them, says the Lord. Don't touch their filthy things and I will welcome you. And I will be your father and you will be my sons and daughters says the Lord Almighty. And so, you know, I think it's interesting how, how um, people can, their outlook can kind of get away from them, you know, when it's like they might, they might come out of those things like he's saying, but then they start to be judgmental toward the people who are still doing those things. But the people who are still doing those things are in bondage. They are trapped in those things. And our goal as ambassadors is to reconcile them to God and then the, the, uh, result the end result of that is then that they are set free and they don't need to be in bondage to those things any longer they're now um, they're now dead to those things he talked about how we we uh, he said we we live for Christ uh, we we died he, he died and he was raised and we were baptized into his death so then we are now um, dead to our past and so uh, those things no longer have an effect on us and that's the same result that we want for the people um, that we are we are stepping out of the lifestyles that they still live in, yet we are not cloistering ourselves behind our walls. Instead, we are living among them. We are not touching the things that they are involved in, yet we are reaching out to them. You see, so we need to be aware of the the balance between these things. So, chapter seven, because we have these promises, dear friends, let us cleanse ourselves from everything that can defile our body or spirit. And let us work toward complete holiness because we fear God. So we talked about that, the fear of the Lord. You know, it, that's the thing that keeps us from doing wrong. The love of the Lord uh, compels us to please him. And so I, I don't want to do wrong because I want to please him. But I also don't want to do wrong because I understand how awesome and powerful he is. 
you know, and so there's a, a, a double portion of motivation, if you will, <laughs> to, to live to please God. Verse 2, please open your hearts to us. We have not done wrong to anyone, nor led anyone astray, nor taken advantage of anyone. I'm not saying this to condemn you. I said before that you are in our hearts, and we live or die together with you. I have the highest confidence in you, and I take great pride in you. You have greatly encouraged me and made me happy despite all our troubles. When we arrived in Macedonia, there was no rest for us. We faced conflict from every direction, with battles on the outside and fear on the inside. But God, who encourages those who are discouraged, encouraged us by the arrival of Titus. His presence was a joy, but so was the news he brought of the encouragement he received from you. When he told us how much you longed to see me, and how sorry you are for what happened, and how loyal you are to me, I was filled with joy. I am not sorry that I sent that severe letter to you, though I was sorry at first, for I know it was painful to you for a little while. Now I am glad I sent it, not because it hurt you, but because the pain caused you to repent and change your ways. It was the kind of sorrow God wants his people to have, so you were not harmed by us in any way. For the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience leads us away from sin and results in salvation. There's no regret for that kind of sorrow. But worldly sorrow, which lacks repentance, results in spiritual death. So he's talking about um, worldly sorrow being that uh, wallowing kind of, um, we're kind of stuck in, in our ways, you know, we, there's, no, there's no hope, there's no future, and so we just go to the world's vices, you know, we drink, we smoke, we do all kinds of other stuff because we are full of sorrow, and those sorrows just kind of stay, they, I mean, they're temporarily, uh, um, like, the, they're, they're temporarily lifted because of the vices that people do, yet um, they, they linger on, they stay with them because they have no hope beyond just the next day's uh, vices that they're going to, that they're going to indulge in. And so he's like, there's two kinds of sorrow. There's that kind of sorrow. He's like, but there's the godly sorrow that leads us to repentance. Um, and then, you know, that, that uh, results in the, the outcome of, of coming to Christ. So he's like, that's the kind of sorrow that God wants us to have, you know, um, and really it's, that's not a, that's not a kind of sorrow that stays with us because once we have repented and we come back to the Lord, then we're full of joy again. And that, that sorrow is gone. And so uh, the, the worldly sorrow just stays and stays and stays. And, uh, you know, if Psalm 127 talks about that, that uh, it's like, unless the Lord builds the house, thank you, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. And then he's like, unless the Lord guards the city, they watch in vain who, who are watching over it. Um, and then it talks about it's vain to stay up late. It's vain to get up early to eat the bread of sorrows. You know, and so people who try to establish their life without God, it, it, that's the bread that they're eating is the bread of sorrows. They're laboring and they're not really accomplishing anything, you know, and some of them are aware of it. Some of them aren't. But even if they're not aware of it, they're, they still feel the effect of, of that um, lack of future, if you will. And so that's why people who... Uh, climb to the top of worldly success all, a lot of times find themselves full of emptiness when they arrive there and they're not really sure why and it's because of that sorrow that worldly sorrow and so um, verse 11 just see what this godly sorrow produced in you such earnestness such concern to clear yourselves such indignation such alarm such longing to see me such zeal and such a readiness to punish wrong you showed that you have done everything necessary to make things right. Yeah, sometimes it, there's lots of things that are necessary to make something right. Lots of things need to be done to set, to set things in order. Verse 12, my purpose then was not to write about who did the wrong or who was wrong. So he's talking about that severe letter. We talked about that in, in the last couple episodes. I wrote to you so that in the sight of God, you could see yourself for yourselves how loyal you are to us. We have been greatly encouraged by this. In addition to our own encouragement, we were especially delighted to see how happy Titus was about the way all of you welcomed him and set his mind at ease. I had told him how proud I was of you, and you didn't disappoint me. I have always told you the truth, and now my boasting to Titus has also proved true. Now he cares for you more than ever when he remembers the way all of you obeyed him and welcomed him with such fear and deep respect. 
I am very happy now because I have complete confidence in you. And so Titus was one of the ministers that uh, Paul had on his ministry team. Later he assigned him uh, to oversee the church on the island of Crete. And of course we'll get to that when we get to the book of Titus. So we won't talk about it here, but let's go ahead and pray. Father, I thank you for uh, showing us the difference between those two kinds of sorrow for, for instructing us in um, our motivations for doing the things that we do and why uh, you have given us the mission that we have. Um, help us to continue to look forward to Jesus' return. Uh, I pray, Father, that uh, we all be found working when you, when you come back. And uh, in Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. All right, well, bless you guys, and we will see you again.